God told Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. It's like a sneak peek into what the book of Joshua is all about. We see God's faithfulness, power, and justice. He brings down walls, delivers victories, and fulfills His promises. As faithful and present as God was with Israel, so He is with us today. We are taught to walk by faith and not by sight, and see what it means to trust, surrender, and obey the Lord. Together, let's behold God's glory in this new sermon series on the book of Joshua. Take hold of what God has given, only here at GCF Ortigas. Good morning, family. Okay, I'm glad we hear each other, and happy Grandparents' Day. I was telling the people uh, at the back and downstairs, I'm envying you, so I'll stop looking at you, grandparent, because I'm starting to sin. One day I'll be a grandparent too. <laughs> and it's a joyful time today. It's a special day today because we honor those people who have passed on their values to us, our lolos and lolas. And I believe it's perhaps not coincidence that, uh, you know, did you just witness the barangay here at the back? That's part of the reason there are so many people at GCF. There's an Enon Christian Fellowship inside us. <laughs> but that reminds us we're really one family, and our passage today is a reminder to us, keep it that way. Keep it a family that is united and together as we look at the altar of altercation. If you've not been here before, for our visitors, we're going to the book of Joshua, and we reach Joshua chapter 22, which talks about a near civil war that happened. And right at the start, I'd like you to look at the geography of the place. Could we show the map, please, before we have a word of prayer? When we talk about the eastern tribes, we're really talking about this dividing line that you see here. It's called the Jordan River. The Jordan River is this thin blue line that's actually above, the, this is the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River extends all the way up from the mountains of Lebanon, that's where it sources some of its water. It also has a lake here, the Lake of Galilee or Sea of Galilee. This is that thin blue line, it ends in the Dead Sea, which is 3,000 feet below sea level. This portion here is called the Land of Gilead. It is the eastern side of the Jordan River here. You remember the points of the compass, of course. And this is the western side. This is the land of Canaan, the land that was promised to Abraham and which nine and a half tribes occupy. We call these the western tribes. Nine and a half tribes, if you count Levi, 10 tribes, and here are two and a half tribes because Manasseh has one half here and one half here. And that's the setting when we begin our story. So I hope you keep your Bibles in front of you because you're going to get lost, including our online brethren. You need a Bible. If you're here on site, you're used, you don't have a Bible, please feel free to use the one in front of you. Uh, I'm on page 235 to 237 if you use our pew Bibles. And the setting begins with the elite soldiers from the Eastern tribes. These are Reuben, God, and half of Manasseh being sent home. They were so glad. You know why? I'll give you a longer version later, but they were being sent home after having kept the word. And that is actually the background of our story. I want to give you the back story, which is found in Joshua 1, 14 to 16. Here, Joshua was talking to these two and a half tribes. He told them, you leave behind your wives, your families, your livestock on the eastern side of the Jordan, because I want you, he said, to help your brothers. So let me read the details there. He said, your wives, your little one, your livestock shall remain in the land Moses gave you, that's east of Jordan, but all the men of valor, that's a term that refers to the elite warriors, shall pass over armed before your brothers. And you will find out in the book of Joshua, they're always being referred to the same way. Men of valor who come ahead. What does it mean? Well, if you are in the military, they're the tip of the spear. They're the elite warriors. They were always the frontliners. These are the elite of the elite among the 
Israelite soldiers, so they were always in front. And says there, you shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers. Then you shall return to the land of your possession after they have helped the western tribes conquer Canaan. And they answered Joshua in verse 13, 16, all that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. It should have been a happy ending. It should have been. But you know, danger comes after victory a lot. They had just conquered all the enemies in the land of Canaan, remember, on the western side. And now they were being sent home. But what happens, if you were attentive to what we were reading, and I know you were, you find out that whether it's nations or churches, the greatest danger is not always the enemy outside. Sometimes it's the enemy within. They had a near civil war. That's what you're reading about. They almost tried to kill each other. And you know what? It meant, it all started because one side meant well. And, and you know this from human experience, no? The saying, I meant well, does not always end well. You can have the best intentions and have the worst wars, which is what happened here. How did they escape the civil war then? And why did they get there in the first place? Well, let's ask God for guidance in our study today. Dear Father, thank you for the very inspiring things that have been going on since the start of the worship. The powerful hymn, the church's one foundation, is Jesus Christ our Lord. Seeing this beautiful grandparents stand up, Father, and reminding us that faith is passed on. Seeing the Enon clan, Father, and realizing that through the ups and downs of family life, you've held them together. And Lord, just seeing your people here sing together, worship together. All of these because of your grace. Now, Father, our prayer is you will be exalted in her midst as we appeal for us to continue being a family, being united, being one being inspired to hold together, being warned against fighting each other. Make us one, Father. Unite us not just by love, but by truth and love, inseparably bound always together. And Father, in our imperfect lives, enable us to keep living with each other, loving, forgiving, bearing with one another as you want us to. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I always ask myself the question, whenever we go, you know we go to the Bible, chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, I always ask myself, why, Lord? Why do you want us to look at this? I believe God wants us to look at this, not because there is a problem right now, but if we're not careful, we will develop a problem in the future. Because if you want to destroy a church, beloved, the quickest way, one of the most effective ways is make them fight. Make them look at each other. Make them criticize each other. Make them nitpick. Instead of serving and evangelizing, let them look at each other's flaws and tell people about it. And now you have social media, no? You don't need expensive press relations officers. You don't need to hire them. You just go on Facebook and you can crucify someone. That's the sad situation we are in now. You want to destroy a church? Division. And the inherent disadvantage, whether you like it or not, or not, of a big church like ours is that things could be brewing in our midst and we're not aware of it because it's lost in the crowd. We don't know who's, who, there might be two families fighting here, we don't even know. There might be people who have not been talking to each other for ages, we don't know. And that's the problem. And Colossians 3, 14 to 15 reminds us, Paul was telling the Colossians, above all these, what these? Other virtues, above all other virtues, put on love, which binds everything together. All Christian virtues are bound together by love in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Paul is saying, Colossians, whatever virtues have admonished you, it's all summarized as love. Just be together. Bear with each other. Forgive each other. Overlook the small offenses. Don't make mountains out of molehills. That's what he's telling us even today. You were called in one body. And I want you to remember this, friends. God calls us to be united by love and truth. Not just by love. Not just by truth. Love and truth. You've heard this before. 
Love without truth is hypocrisy. It's compromise. But truth without love is brutality. They need to be together. That's how we hold together as a family in the sight of God. Now open your Bibles with me. We don't have a lot of time to cover the entire chapter. We divided it in four major movements like the story that, like a story should be. The first major movement is in the first nine verses, the recognition of the Eastern tribe. And this is beautiful to listen to. In verses one to four, you see the commendation of the Eastern tribe. Why is Joshua commanding, commending them? You know why? For over seven years, the elite warriors of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh did not see their families. I don't know about you, but if you love your wife, your children, you love your home, seven years, could you really bear to be apart from your family for seven years? This was not a small sacrifice, friend. This was a big one. And there's every evidence to show they did not, you know, have vacations. The seven years was a constant grind of war after war after war until they had conquered the entirety of Canaan. It's safe to assume they probably never even went home for a brief period during those seven years. And that, friends, is faithfulness, not just to Joshua, not just to Israel. It was faithfulness to God. And I want you to remember that faithfulness to God, like for them, is always rewarded by God in his perfect time. Why do I emphasize that? Because of Galatians 6, 9. Look at what Galatians 6, 9 says. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Why? For in due season we will reap. There is a right time. There is a due season that we will reap, but there's a condition. What is it if we do not give up? You know, sometimes we blame God. Lord, I know this is your will. I know you want me to raise my son or daughter right, but it's so hard, Lord. And so, you might continue to be the parent, but in your heart, you have given up. So what happens? You stop praying. You stop trying. Or the marriage is difficult. And you're tempted to say, I've done my best. But hands up. So you stay there, you're physically together, but you're not really husband and wife at heart. You're saying, you don't know how hard it is. I don't. You know how hard it is for to not see your wife and children for seven years? They didn't even know when they would see them. They bore with it for seven years. And we blame God when actually we gave up long before God gave up. It says there, if we do not give up. If there is something God wants you to do, most of the time you will give up long before God will ever, ever give up. In fact, God never will. Stay there. Do what God wants you to do. I know it's hard. It might be sacrificial, but stay there. And if you give up, please do not blame God. Please do not point your finger at God. You gave up. Now, I was saying this because this morning I, I, I found... Someone sitting over there. Uh, I asked his permission, by the way, to share this. Uh, he and his wife got saved. Uh, he and his partner, living partner, got saved. And then when they got saved, I, you know, I told them, you need to get married. So you have kids already. I said, Pastor, I'm working on annulling my previous marriage. That's the only reason we cannot yet get married. So for the past I think five years, I've been jump, three years on, jumping on their back. Oh, Asana, where is it? Where is it? I want to marry you too. I want to wed you too. Finally, last Saturday, I did the wedding. He never gave up. It was expensive for him. Uh, he had to do so much work. He had, he had to go to the bureaucracy. Uh, friends, he knew what God's will was. And he and his now new wife, they honored God. Don't give if that's the only thing you get from Galatians 6, 9, please don't give up. If it's God's will, even if it kills you, don't give up. It will be worth it. I promise you, God will not fail you. He never fails us. We fail him, and we fail him when we give up. That's the commendation of the Eastern tribe. They did not give up. 
Now, what did he do after he commanded them? In verse 5, he now commanded them. This is a good teacher. You commend them, and then you command them. Verse 5, I'll summarize it. He's actually saying, driven by love for God, you walk with him, you obey his word, and serve him wholeheartedly. I think this is a very important instruction. You know why? Because Jesus repeats the same idea as the great commandment. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, somebody asked him, what's the great commandment? He said, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what Josh is saying in verse 5. He's actually telling us now, driven by love for God, you do all the rest. So what is he saying? You walk with him, that means relate with him. You see, if you're my friend, if, for example, if Harold here is my friend, I could tell Harold, you know what, Harold, I love you. But I don't have to relate with him. So proof of my real love for him is I relate with him. Okay? So that's why he said, walk with him. He also said, obey his commandments. You know, I can again relate with Harold, but I don't have to do a thing he says. Harold could tell me, Pastor, could you help me write a prescription for me for my medicine? I could tell him, I'm not obeying you. I do love you. I will relate to you, but I'm not obeying you. And one more, serve him. If you really love somebody, not only will you relate with him, not only will you obey what he's saying or he's requesting, you'll serve him. And that's what Josh was saying, and it's instructive for us. We are to be driven by love for God. You know why we have a difficulty with obeying God? We put the cart before the horse. We have not yet loved God with all our hearts because we've not meditated on God. We've not appreciated everything He has done for us. And we're not trying to obey Him. Friends, we need to reflect on the grace of God to us. That grace drives us to love Him. And love is the motivator for us to obey God. Otherwise, Christianity is very miserable, I promise you. If you think Christianity is a set of rules to follow because we need to, because this God wants to be followed, it's going to be very hard. But if you look at Christianity as a relationship, where there's a God who's given you everything, he's he's given you his son, he died on the cross. So you grow in love for God. Every communion is supposed to remind us we need to love God back because of what he did for us through Jesus. As you grow in love, obedience grows. As you grow in love, relationship gets deeper. As you grow in love, we serve him. That's why there are people who die for Christ, serving Christ, missionaries who live, you know, their comfortable lives in developed countries and come into a place like ours, go to dangerous places like Mindanao, because they love God. He's worth dying for. He's worth sacrificing for. And that's what you see here in the command. Now, Pastor, why will he give a command like this then he can give them at any point in time. You know why he's saying this? Because they're isolated. Do you remember the map? I'll not show it. I'll show it later. But the map told you, showed you, there was a dividing line between them called the Jordan River. Two to three months of the year, you could not cross the Jordan River. Usually that's late winter and early spring. Because late winter, the snow from the mountains of Lebanon, they'll melt. And late winter and early spring, Jordan River becomes a raging current that even the strongest swimmers cannot cross. So sometimes two and two and a half months of the year, you could not cross, so it was a barrier. They were isolated. And friends, geographical isolation, in this case, made him give them this command. Now, after this, after the recognition, concluding with the command, we go to verses 10 to 20 where you see the root of civil war. This is where the whole problem started. In verse 10, you see an unnecessary altar in verse 10. And uh, what happened? There? I'll read this for you in verse 10. When they, that's Reuben, God, and Manasseh, imagine this, about 40,000 elite warriors, They leave, okay? These are all men. All the women, children, elderly were left on the other side seven years ago. These are all battle-hardened veterans, the elite of the elite in the military. They leave. Just before they reach the Jordan, they made a decision in verse 10. And what is that? When they came to the region of Jordan in the land of Canaan, so they had not yet crossed, the people of Reuben, the people of God, and the half of Manasseh built an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. Now, could we show the map this time again? 
to be fair to this group, now we'll use this, okay? So, uh, they departed, and maybe somewhere near the border of Benjamin here, or, Jer- or the border of Judah, before they crossed over here, so this is called the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the land of Gilead, or the eastern tribe, they built an altar here, not in their land, but here. You must be asking, why? That's weird. They'll explain later. We'll get there. But that was their decision. And it was obviously, verse 11 repeats the idea, it was obviously in the land of the western tribes. And so, uh, what is wrong with this, pastor? Why do you say this is unnecessary? We'll give you the details later, but because this was not commanded by God. It was their decision. God never asked them to do it. Uh, they, they had good intentions, okay? That's why we said that the earlier part of the message, I meant well does not always end well. This is an example. They had good intentions, but beloved, worship should be done according to God's will and God's way. Now, some of you perhaps have come from other, you know, religious persuasions. You find our worship a bit formal, no? So you say, Pastor, no one is falling down or rolling on the floor. Uh, frankly, I'm glad, but, uh, but you're so sedate and calm. I hope you don't say boring, but peaceful. Okay, that's the good word. Why are we like that? Well, the Bible gives us the elements of worship. So there is a way of worshiping God that God desires. Jesus hinted at that in John 4, 24, when he was witnessing to the woman at the well. The woman had been telling Jesus, you know what? We worship, we Samaritans, we worship God in this way. The response of Jesus in John 4, 24 is actually, in a sense, to tell her about her spiritual state. Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit, that small letter S, and truth. What is in spirit? It's implied there that this is from the right kind of heart, meaning a saved, regenerate heart. Implying, woman, that's not yet you. And then he said, in truth, what does it mean? Worship acceptable to God is carried out according to God's will in the Bible. Woman, you Samaritans are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. God is not limited to places. He is worshipped in spirit from a saved heart and according to God's way in his Word. How does this apply to our lives when we talk about unnecessary altars? That's the reason why we worship the way we do. There are elements, and I'll mention them to you in our worship, preaching, singing, praying, scripture reading, offering, and the ordinances. That's it. We may differ from other churches in the form and the mode, but those are the basic things. You see them all over the New Testament. You see singing in the Old Testament. You have preaching in the Old Testament too. They're all over both Testaments because our God is not just concerned with the fact that we worship Him, but how we worship Him matters. But there's a personal application I want to drive home. The problem with the unnecessary altar is that it was a spiritual issue. And Reuben, God, and Manasseh simply forgot that spiritual issues need spiritual guidance. You follow me? There's no evidence whatsoever they consulted any spiritual leader. Uh, How do you know that, Pastor? Because Phinehas was the son of Eleazar, the high priest. Phinehas should have known. They never consulted him or Eleazar, the high priest, or any Levite. Remember, there are Levites scattered all over Israel, including on the other side. They didn't consult them. They just made their own solution. That reminds us, you're in a family. That's why I always greet you, good morning, family. You know why? It's true. It's not a motherhood statement. You are a family. We are a family. You know what? We're actually closer than a family. You know what we are? We're a body. I didn't invent that. It's found in 1 Corinthians 12, 26 to 27. It says there, if one member suffers, all suffer together. You see how much closer that is than just a family? If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you're the body of Christ and individually members of it. What should they have done? They should have consulted their spiritual leaders. What do you do when you have a spiritual issue? 
First of all, I advise you to go to the Word of God. Do not go to YouTube. Uh, do not go to social media. Consult the Word of God. And if you need help, you have pastors, you have elders, you have deacons and growth group leaders here. Consult your leaders. Now, we're not perfect. Those of you who have communicated with me know many times I answer you quickly in a snap. But there are times I tell you, I'll get back to you. Because I need to open my Bible. If I need help, I need to open my books on systematic theology. But I will get back to you. I will do my best to help you. And every pastor, elder, deacon here will do the same. Consult them. Don't go it alone. You will do the same mistake of Reuben, God, and Manasseh. You're in a body closer than a family. Don't go it alone, friend. Don't make the mistake they did. Now, why did this lead to civil war? Because it takes two to tango. What was the other part? The unhealthy reaction. Unnecessary altar, then unhealthy reaction. Look at verse 12. What did they do at verse 12? They wanted to wipe them out. That's what it says in verse 12. They got ready for war. Can you imagine how disastrous this would have been? Don't forget this 40,000 men who went back are the elite of the elite. They are the best soldiers. Now, you might say, that's nine and a half tries versus two and a half. It doesn't matter. No one wins in a civil war. Do you agree with me? Do you think it's good for us that we're winning against the new people's army or the insurrection in the south? Nobody wins in a civil war. Everyone loses. This has been disastrous. They beat the other nations. Now they were going to kill each other. And why was there an unhealthy reaction? Judgmental attitudes, friends. That's what happened here. They prejudged the, the, the eastern tribes, the western tribes prejudged them. And I'm sorry for the typo in the bulletin. That's my fault. It should be Luke 637. It says in Luke 637, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. What is this about? Don't be judgmental. It's not against discernment. It's not against righteous judgment. It's against a self-righteous attitude that makes me judge you. And that is almost always going to lead to a wrong conclusion. If I evaluate you with a self-righteous heart, almost always I'll make a wrong conclusion. This is what happened here. They jumped to the conclusion that these people are apostate. They were zealous for the glory of God. That's commendable. But they were wrong in their conclusion because they jumped to conclusions. Friends, if you need exercise, please do not do the exercise of jumping to conclusions. You know, if you want exercise, uh, there are other kinds of exercise. You can go jump in the lake, go fly a kite, or take a hike. But don't jump to conclusions because in this case, it almost led to civil war. But have you ever wondered, why is it so easy to assign the worst motives to other people. Why is gossip so juicy, you know? Even the most calm, sedate person, if you tell them, have you heard the latest, you know? Uh, Mare, <laughs> Mare, have you heard the latest? Why is it that uh, against your own conviction, oh, Sige, what's the latest? Why? Why are we so tempted by gossip? You know why? Sinful human nature. It caters to the worst in us. Whenever we think someone is worse than us, we feel good about ourselves. Be honest. That's why we love gossip. Oh, there's someone worse than me. In GCF, I feel good. That's not what you say, but that's what's really in our heart. That's why judging others is so easy. That's why gossip is so delectable. Sinful human nature feels better about itself when another person is seemingly worse. So the unhealthy reaction plus the unnecessary alter civil war. They would have killed each other. God protected them for seven years from the much more equipped Canaanite tribes, but they are about to kill each other, and they were going to do a great job at it. But in verses 21 to 29, we'll see the reason for the altar. And before we go to verse 27, I'd like to bring you to the narrative. What's the sequence of events? So, in fairness 
to the Western tribes. They were willing to hear them out before they would wipe them out. That's always a good idea, okay? Before you blow somebody away, you first hear them out. That's what they were going to do. Verses 13 to 18, they sent a delegation headed by the son of the high priest, Phineas. And uh, he was being groomed to take over in the future. He was accompanied by the heads of the 10 tribes, including the tribe of Levi. And this delegation, they did the healthy, healthy thing of confronting and then hearing them out. So they confronted them. Very, very meaty accusation, but very wrong. They, they talked about, have you forgotten the sin at Baal Peor? I will not go there. It's a long story. Have you forgotten the story of Achan when Achan caused the entire nation to be defeated? Have you forgotten this? So confrontation. Done in love, but still done, in, done face to face. They heard them out. What else? In verse 19, if you look at verse 19, they offered help. That's why I'm very safe to say that this people really wanted reconciliation. You know what they said in verse 19? They said, look, if you cannot worship there in the eastern side, cross over. Lipat. You go over to the western side. In other words, we will sacrifice our land. Just give up this apostasy because that's what they thought was happening. What is that? Sacrificial help. When you go to someone that you want to talk with and you actually are willing to sacrifice yourself, it shows the sincerity of your heart to love the other person and to solve the problem. What else? After they offered help, here comes the answer of the other side. First, they invoke God. They said, the mighty God, the Lord, twice. And they were actually invoking God as a witness, and they were not going to quarrel. They were going even to say, look, if we're really guilty, may God himself be the one to take vengeance. But instead, they explain their side very well. And friends, this is Proverbs 15.1. If this is your situation, you need to remember Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know what they could have said? Have you forgotten who helped you get your lunch, you ungrateful people? That's what they could have said. Many of us are dead helping you win your land. We could have not gone with you there. We could have stayed with our family. That's not what they said. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words, harsh words, stir up anger. But he, this is now where they led to verse 27. They said the altar is to be a witness between us and you, between your generation after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings. In other words, we are not going to use that altar for sacrifice. It's just a visual aid, a visual illustration for whom? If you read verses 21 to 26, for the children on both sides. So that the children on the other side will say, you cannot worship with us because you're not one of us. So that their own children will say, oh, we do belong to them. They meant well, okay? Let's be fair to the Eastern tribe. They meant well. But that's why your outline says the best intentions don't always have the right outcomes. Why? We told you earlier, and I'll give you the detail, the altar was completely unnecessary. It was not necessary. Why? Because God told Israel through Moses in Exodus 23, 17, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Now, this meant that three times a year, they were going to cross over into the altar at the western side and worship with their brothers there. That was what God intended so that they will never have a division. It was enough. But they wanted to do their own way, which God never mandated. And this new altar was never required by God. If you'll notice in the Old Testament, altars were always made according to instructions by God, or it was commended by God after it was built. This was never done here. Did you notice that? No instructions from God, no consult with any priest or spiritual authority, and no positive comment from God. In fact, the whole narrative implies 
It was a bad decision. It really was. This altar was a man-made solution to a spiritual issue. What's the result? Near civil war. They survived the other nations, but they're about to kill each other. That's catastrophe, my friends. How does this apply to us, Pastor? I put a question there for you to reflect on. Are there parallels existing in your life? Are there any spiritual issues you're handling on your own rather than letting the Bible or the body of Christ help you out? Please. I already said this earlier. I just want to reinforce it. Don't go it alone. You're in a family. You're in a body. Let us walk alongside you. Help each other. Consult each other. There's another application here, friends. I think this is going to be obvious to you when I point it out. The danger of geographical isolation. The danger of geographical isolation. I'm going out on a limb, okay? You need to pray for me. But I'm not going to be apologetic about this. To our online beloved brothers and sisters, May I be clear on this? If you're not hindered by health or distance, it is always better to be on site than online. Let me repeat that. If you're not hindered by health or distance, it's always better to be on site than online. Online is not sinful, but it's risky. The first reason it's better to be on site is we miss you. We want to see you. Uh, you see us, we don't see you. I'll give you a second reason why on-site is better than online if you're not hindered by health or distance. Some temptations are just too strong online. These are top of the mind, common sense, no-brainer temptations. One, the temptation of not serving. It's very hard to serve God from the living room or bedroom, yes or no. Do not be angry with me. I love you, we love each other, but I have to call it. Number two, the temptation to be distracted. Do you remember when we were all online? Uh, you know, I was preaching from our sala or the bedroom because it was farthest from our loud Labrador retriever. You know, when he barked, I sometimes tempted to, what is Stark barking about? Even me, I was already preaching. How much more you, you know? Uh, you're listening to this. Pastor Larry's exceeded 30 minutes. Now my bottom is getting sore. I go back, check my Facebook. That's the problem. I'm sorry if I'm hurting your feelings. We just miss you. There's a third reason. It's called emotional distance. You might get used to emotional distance from other Christians. And the Bible is very clear. In Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, that's not God's design for a church. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. So how could you stir up other people to love and good works when we're not meeting together, as is the habit of some? But encouraging one another. How can we encourage one another if we're not seeing each other because some of us are in our bedrooms or living room? And he said, and all the more as you see the day growing near. Online worship is not sinful, but it is risky. There are temptations. These are just the more common ones. Temptations to not serve, temptation to get distracted, temptation to be emotionally distant permanently. So if you're not hindered by health or distance, go on site. Last night somebody told me, Pastor, you might lose some people online. I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, I'm not talking about those who feel hurt who live in Metro Manila. He said, those who live in other countries, those who live in Mindanao, in Ilocos, in other parts of the world, said, good, let them go to an on-site church for the same reasons I just came. It's okay. If, if you're listening to me, maybe on YouTube or Facebook after, and you say, okay, well, I, I, I'm going to stop listening to GSEP because there's a good church nearby. Go for it. It's okay. Because I promise you, it's better for you spiritually, and it's better for that church. On-site 
is always better than online if you're not hindered by health or distance. If you have health problems, don't feel guilty. If you're very far away, it's okay. But still find an on-site church. Now, there's another group of people I want to address about a second altar. You see, like the tribe of Reuben, God, and Manasseh, you might be sincere about another way of worshiping God. For example, you say, you know, pastor, I'm listening to you. I think I'm a believer in Christ because I believe the same things you do. I believe Christ is the Son of God. Yes, but if you stand before God someday and he asks you, why will I let you into my kingdom? What will you say? Oh, because I believe the same things as Greenhouse Christian Fellowship. That's not going to hold water with Christ. The only way God will accept us in his kingdom is if we say, Christ died on the cross for me. I came to him as a sinner with nothing to offer, completely bankrupt spiritually. And I ask him to forgive my sins. I ask him to forgive the sinner. And I pleaded with him to save me because I put all my trust in him. If you use words like that, the idea is that, the thought is that, even if you don't get the exact words, if you put all your faith in Christ who died on the cross, who took our place, if that's the only thing you have bet your entire life on earth and your entire eternity upon, if Christ and only Christ is your only hope, that's the only way God will ever let you become part of his family. If not, you're still believing in another altar. You're no different from Reuben, God, and Manasseh. And if you've heard this more than once, you're in greater danger because every time you hear the gospel and you're invited to the cross and you reject it, Jesus said the words that you have heard will be held as evidence against you. I hope if you're here on site or you're listening online and these words refer to you, stop holding out. Just come to the cross. Never mind the words. God looks at repentance towards God and faith in Christ. Please, come to the right altar. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. He is the only way God gave us to be forgiven and reconciled to him. Let's look at the resolution of the crisis, friends. I purposely omitted, uh, that's why the good-looking scripture reader, by the way, uh, that's my son, I'm biased. Uh, He did not read the resolution because I'm going to read it for you. It's in verse 33. It says in verse 33, the report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel, and the people of Israel blessed God and spoke no more of war against them. That's the happy ending. And there are lessons here for relational issues. And before we talk about the process, I want to drive home one thing. When there are conflicts, heart, over process first. You get me? Heart over process. You see, if I do not like you, whether it's in a family, it's in a church, it's in the office, it's in the business, I can use the process, the policy, like a weapon. Oh, I do not like this church leader. So I will look for something I can throw. Because this, this G said, it's so organized, it's like a bank. Everything is in policy. I look for a policy against this church leader. That's why we're saying heart over process. Before you talk about process, check your heart. It's safe to say the heart of the Western tribes was right. How do you know that, Pat? They were willing to sacrifice their land for the sake of reconciliation. They meant it. They really did not want to kill They're brothers. So what are the lessons here after establishing heart over process? One, confront lovingly and hear out the other side. Most of us here are Asians, okay? About 99% of us here are Asians. What is the number one way that we Asians in our culture handle relational issues? It starts with the letter A, okay? It's our favorite way of handling relational issues. Can I hear a guess? Avoidance. I do. I like Ed a lot, so I'll use him as an example. I do not like you, Ed. Okay? You've hurt me. So what will I do? I'll never tell you. But I'll tell everyone else. (laughs) Did I solve the problem? No, I just created the, the problem much bigger than it should be. And please, 
I will warn you repeatedly, do not use social media. It is so unfair to people. That's why some time ago when somebody railed against our church, people were, you know, sending messages of panic to me. I said, look, ignore it. You're not going to answer, Pastor. No, we're not going to answer. Why? Well, we've been railed against first. You think we'll gain any point by answering social media? Let God handle it. And sure enough, nobody remembers it anymore because it was all unfounded and untrue. But please, be a genuine Christian. Social media is one of the worst crucifixion you can ever give anyone. What is the way? Matthew 18, 15. If you have an issue with someone, approach the person. Stop being Asian in that sense. Stop being Pinoy in that sense. Approach the person lovingly like the Western tribes did, but you do approach the person one-on-one. -on -one. Confront and do it with a good heart. Hear people out before you wipe them out, okay? So Galatians 6, 1 reminds us, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Number two, offer help. In verse 19, they're willing to sacrifice their land to restore their brothers to proper worship. The sincerity of their love and desire for reconciliation is shown here. Number three, give the benefit of the doubt about motives. In verse 30, so remember the long explanation, very long. I let it be read in its entirety, the explanation of the Western tribe, of the Eastern tribe, I'm sorry. Why? Because it was true. They were sincere. While they were sincerely wrong, they were sincere. What was the response of the other side? They took it. You know what they could have said? Oh, we don't believe you. You're just afraid because we outnumber you. They could have said that. What would have happened? Okay, let's fight. But they took it at face value. And that helps in relationships, friend. When someone explains, give them the benefit of the doubt. Verse 30 says, after they explained, it says here, it was good in their eyes. They gave the benefit of that. Then, what do you do? Be open to your faults. It was the accuser's turn to accept they misjudged the, East, the, West, the Eastern tribe's motives in verse 31. Because Phineas said in verse 31, today we know you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. What is it saying? Exactly a roundabout way of saying, you know what? We misjudge you. We were wrong about you. It's his way of saying it. We're actually totally wrong in the way we evaluated you. And number five, when the issue is settled, rejoice in harmony and bury the issue. That's what you find in verses 32 to 34. They never raise the issue again. You know what? If we do the same, We'll have peace in our homes and churches if we do the same. Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So let's close. Both sides were imperfect. Remember, neither was actually pure. One side made a dumb decision. Oh, it's a spiritual issue. Oh, let's make our decision. Hopefully, everyone will accept it. Never mind. Don't talk to any priest. Don't talk to the high priest. Let's just do this. Really wrong. The other side, ah, oh, apostates. What do we do with apostates? We wipe them off the face of the earth. Both were wrong. But they had one thing in common that was important to God. In fairness to both of them, they both had a passion for the faithful worship of God. That's why I believe God superintended, oversaw, and blessed the outcome. They did not go to civil war because God honored that both the eastern tribes wanted to worship God. The western tribes wanted the glory of God and the right worship of God. And God said, I'll not let you kill each other. That's the outcome. We can safely say God intervened here because of what they got right. Rupert Muldenius made the statement famous. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And this reminds me of two of the most famous evangelists in history. George Whitfield and John Wesley lived, both live in the 18th century. Both of them started in England, but Whitfield crossed over to America. And both were used by God to save thousands and thousands of people. Imagine Billy Graham transported 
to the 18th century, that was each of them. They were good friends, but they had different doctrines. Whitfield, like us, believed in the sovereignty of God, unconditional election, limit, uh, perseverance of the saints, and so on, while Wesley is what you'd call today Arminian. He believed you could lose salvation, uh, and he did not believe in unconditional election. Despite their doctrinal differences, sometimes they debated in letters, which are still with us today, they never stopped loving each other. You know how we know? They had an agreement. If one of us dies before the other, the other must speak at his funeral. Whitfield died ahead, and John Wesley gave him a eulogy, a sermon, that until today is one of the best examples of how to honor someone. And Whitfield, when he was still alive, was asked by one of his devoted fanatic followers. Whitfield was asked by this man, do you think we'll see Wesley in heaven? This man was more angry than Whitfield at Wesley. And Whitfield answered, I'm afraid not. And of course, people were shocked. What do you mean? We'll not see. He said, Wesley will be so near the throne of God and we will be so far, we shall hardly see him. These two men did not agree on doctrine, but they loved each other. Beloved, we are to be united by love and truth. We sang, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word from heaven. He came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood, he bought her. And for her life, he died. Who do you think? Who do you think is the most interested that this church, in every Christ-centered, Bible-believing church, be united and never fight with each other? Who do you think is the one who shed his blood for it? There is no one who could ever lay to that claim except Christ. He's the only one who gave his life for the church like he did. Beloved, you want to break the heart of God? You want to break the heart of Christ? Let's fight. But if you do not want to do that, let's forgive each other. If it's small, let it go. If you want intervention, then ask for help. If you want advice, there are spiritual leaders here. But let's never fight. It doesn't please God. Civil war inside the church is called division. It will destroy us faster than anything. But if our church family is always united about the most essential things, Satan can never divide us because, beloved, God calls us to be united by love and truth. May it always be so. May we always be one family in the sight of God by the grace of God. Let's stand together for a final prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we honor you and we exalt you today. We thank you that it is your blood that gave us what we could never earn, our salvation. And we pray now, O oh God, that by your grace, enable us that in our imperfect state, while all of us are works in progress, division inside this family will never, ever be an option. That we will do everything to reconcile with each other. If we have to face each other, help us do that in love, Father. But please keep your church one. Remind us always how expensive it was for you to purchase this church. And help us, Father, in our love for you to honor that and preserve the unity of this church. Now bless your people as they go. Bless every grandparent, Lord, with joy and delight in the values they have passed on to their children and grandchildren. Bless those who will walk with you and keep this church whole. We thank you for all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You go with God.